So uh, my name is Regina Barzilai and I am professor in electrical engineering and computer science and I am um, AI faculty lead for Jamil Clinic, which is an organization with an MIT that um, works on machine learning and health. And I am uh, delighted today to have a very distinguished panel uh, to look at one specific disease, breast cancer. And uh, before we would, you know, drill into this specific uh, disease, I want to start by introducing uh, the members of the panel. Uh, each one of them uh, worked uh, very hard on, you know, improving uh, healthcare methods for breast cancer and improving outcomes for the diverse population. Uh, so the first uh, panelist uh, is Dr. Judy Gachea. She is a uh, radiologist and assistant professor in Emory University. She also leads a informatics lab, which combines, you know, clinical uh, AI and radiology together. And she uh, dedicates significant uh, portion of her research uh, to the questions of equity. And actually, I was privileged to meet her first time when she invited me to the dedicated panel on this topic uh, in the Conference of American College of Radiology. Uh, the second panelist is uh, Dr. Salewa Waseni, who is a um, sergeant at uh, MGH and uh, also work in the area of breast cancer. So there are a lot of interesting things to say about Dr. Waseni, but one which really impressed me that she was a sergeant in the Navy. Uh, and besides that, she also co-director of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee at the uh, MGH Department of Surgery. And uh, the last but not least is uh, Adam Yala, who is a PhD student at uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at MIT, uh, who is you know, the main developer of many AI tools for early detection of breast cancer and who collaborated with some of our other panelists on you know, ensuring equitable outcomes. Uh, so with that, I would like um, to welcome our panelists and, you know, start the panel. Uh, so uh, uh, if I may just ask uh, Ignacio, can we just see all the panelists together? Thank you. Um, Great. Um, uh, so um, the reason I decided when I was creating the program for the conference and I convinced my co-chairs to include a special session on breast cancer, because I think it's really an interesting disease. Uh, on one hand, we know and we already had at the beginning of the conference, uh, Dr. Stoltz was telling to us that the outcomes for African-American women, for instance, are um, very different in terms of mortality from um, white patients. At the same time, we know that there are humongous resources that are invested in doing population screening, try to identify cancer early. So it's kind of mind boggling. How come we're putting so much resources into it, trying to serve the whole population, but some portion of the populations have such a different outcomes. So I would like to start our panel with asking uh, Dr. Sene to tell us what, in her opinion, you know, contributes to these very different outcomes in some populations versus others? Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barzile, for having me on this panel. Um, I've enjoyed a lot of the uh, talks that have, ha um, have happened so far, and they've given uh, so much good information on why this is such a complex problem. Um, and a lot of what I've heard this morning applies to breast also. Um, so as, uh, as the first speaker um, started talking about breast cancer, it remains the leading, um, the leading cancer diagnosis in women in the United States. And unfortunately, um, despite screening and closing the screening gap, um, even though black women are less likely to have breast cancer compared to uh, Caucasian women, um, the mortality is still a lot higher. And we've, we've, I think, identified now that it's a multifactorial problem, and that's part of the issue in trying to address this disparity. Um, we focused, I would say, that the first 20 years of breast cancer um, was focused on screening, 
let's detect these cancers early. Let's make sure we can identify women. And so we put a lot of effort into building screening programs around the country, um, into going out into the community and developing you know, a screening program. Um, you, you have the screening on wheels, all these different ways to try and get women screened. Um, I think that as we, you know, as screening has gotten better, we're also now recognizing that, you know, we, there are ways that we may optimize screening so that we can identify uh, breast cancer early, not just in, um, not just in Caucasian women, which is what we've seen so far, but also um, in African American women or women with dense breasts. There are so many other subsets that we're hoping to fine tune our screening technology to help identify these women earlier. Um, and then the other part of that though, is when we think about identification and identifying breast cancer at early stages, the, uh, the disparity then comes into treatment, um, treatment which is mitigated to some extent by access. And as people have uh, mentioned this morning, there are so many socioeconomic determinants of health that impact access to care. Uh, and so even if you, um, when, we, when you look at the data, yes, people will talk about biology and say that women, um, black women are more likely to have triple negative breast cancer, which is more aggressive. But if, even if you look at subsets of uh, patients with triple negative breast cancer alone, black women have worse outcomes. Um, if you look at hormone receptor positive cancers, um, black women also have worse outcomes in those settings. Um, despite uh, these having favorable features and um, you know having excellent treatments for that. And some of the things that contribute um, to these poor outcomes are um, how early are they diagnosed? At what stage? Do they get the same treatment? Is there a delay to treatment? Because we've seen that uh, in many instances, there is a delay to surgery that, or delay to radiation that is not um, well explained, even in patients who have access. And that's very important to note because we see some of these health disparities even within health systems where the patients are already in the system. So they, that means that they have access, they're in the system, and yet they may have delay to get surgery, delay to start radiation therapy, um, and then lastly, when we talk about uh, you know, treatment with regards to endocrine therapy or um, the adjuvant therapies that are out there and that we've done a lot of research on, uh, we find that once again, a lot of these studies are underpowered um, and not so much underpowered, but the diversity in the patient population is a problem. And so we don't have a good representation of minority women, whether they be African-American women uh, Latina women, Asian women. And so we're extrapolating a lot of these studies and their outcomes and results um, that were primarily done on a large body of Caucasian women. And so uh, it's, multi, it's a multifactorial problem, um, but there's no question that, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that with tools like this and AI, uh, we can optimize, you know, some of these, uh, some of these problems that we see and hopefully remove uh, or eliminate some of these disparities. Thank you very much. So uh, as you already mentioned that, you know, screening and early detection really plays, you know, significant role here. And I know that Dr. Gichua th thought a lot about, you know, how screening can be optimized for, you know, to kind of improve the outcomes for all, and also how AI can play, uh, you know, beneficial role rather than exacerbating current discrepancies. So would you like to comment on that, Dr. Gichua? Uh, thank you, Dr. Basile, for a fantastic conference. And I've also been following really great speakers all, all day. And I hope you can hear me well. I'm, I may have some network connectivity issues. But um, so I think the issue about screening, it's almost like a, a representative of the health of the population. And I'm excited about the application of AI to this area because it's we move away from the debate for AI is going to replace radiologists or replace doctors to really bring a superpower that's not even there in the first place. And so uh, as a radiologist, when I'm screening or 
taking care of a patient in this sort of, uh, you know, RVU based system, you're mainly focused on the study that's ahead of you. You're not really thinking honestly sometimes of the bigger outcome for the patient. And so this new uh, form of thinking about AI as either developing these new metrics or allowing us to look at the data in new ways that we haven't done before, I think is super exciting. And we've had several talks, not just today on breast AI, but also on arthritis and uh, also the managed uh, population algorithms for referral. Now, when I say screening is uh, sort of a health, you know, a health wellness check is that you just think about uh, when we think about designing for women, specifically about breast cancer screening, the, you know, designing for women using data, we usually reference the 70 kg male as the default, you know, you're not, then the woman sort of, even if we make half of the population, we're always sort of designing around the male uh, sort of uh, form, even if you think about our anatomy books. And when you think about this perception, then uh, one is that you have to think there are people who have double burden of work. This has been super important in COVID times where people have to take care of their children, their spouses and partners, and you know, real still do work. And how do you sort of design? There's no screening for breast cancer at night, you know? And then you, if you look at the patterns that happen in terms of um, healthcare insurance, in December, it's very, very busy, more than January. Why? Because people want to meet their deductibles. So they fashion their screening, again, around deductibles. Now, if you're trying to just treat someone who relies on public means and Sometimes it's not reliable and they just have a fixed time slot. I mean, there's so much to do. And that's why a personalized approach to breast cancer screening is not just the healthcare that we deliver, but the system in which we deliver the healthcare. And I think AI allows us honestly to first be able to analyze those types of data, but also uncover new patterns. Uh, and maybe as we start to think about implementing how to lower the barriers uh, as we move along. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to say, uh, again, coming back to the point about the screening and the risk, because on one hand, the systems like Medicare and many other systems have, um, you know, inside kind of uh, mechanism to identify high risk population. And uh, one of them is called therapeutic. It's, it's a measurement that looks, you know, at different kind of um, demographics and health data about the woman and tells what is the likelihood of this woman to get breast cancer. It's true for breast cancer, it's true for other diseases, but breast cancer is actually routinely used to decide about uh, you know, reimbursement of insurance, what kind of follow-ups the woman can get. And what's interesting, and I actually <laughs> discovered it because I met the, the person who created this measurement, uh, Dr. Kuzik, and he was explicitly telling us that this measurement was designed for white women in London. I mean, he never claimed anything beyond that. It was a statistical model that was fit for a particular population, but it is used across the country for all different types of women. And even though there are studies that explicitly demonstrate that the accuracies that you get, for instance, in African-American or Latino population are really terrible. It doesn't work great for white women either, but for this population, which it was not fit, it, actually introduces a lot of mistakes. So here you can even see that there is a, like an equitable law that if you are identify as high risk according to this measurement, you can get all these benefits because the measurement is not designed for, for this minority groups. As a result, um, you know, they are clearly disadvantaged in many ways. Uh, so, and I wanted now to let Adam tell us about, you know, what he was doing jointly actually with uh, Dr. Gachoya's uh, group uh, on um, developing AI tools and testing them on a variety of populations. Adam, would you like to share your slide or do you want to talk uh, about yeah, it? Thank you. Yeah, so I want to briefly talk about our recent work in building breast cancer risk models directly from mammography. So this is covered in a recent publication earlier this year in Science and Racial Medicine. So people, as Regina already mentioned, have been trying to predict future risk for a long time. And what we really focused on doing is seeing, okay, well, how much richer can we learn directly from a woman's breast tissue to predict who's gonna get cancer in five years? And we focus a lot on making sure that this model only works well, but also works well across all the different subgroups and different subpopulations that we could look at. So when we first started, we started with the MGH data set where we built and trained the model. And we saw that the model was much, much more accurate than the entire QSIC model. And we did a lot of auditing to make sure it works well across different racial subgroups, a lot of and different age base, uh, age subgroups, different density categories, to make sure there's no obvious holes in the performance. 
But from a very early stage, we knew that the MGH data set is fundamentally limited and that it's you know 80% Caucasian, it's not infinitely large. And so we can't really be confident from these numbers alone or really for prime time. So we've been working very, very hard to validate the model across a very broad spectrum. And we've been very lucky to work with Dr. J.J. Koya's group at Emory to validate the model on a large representative African American population. But we've been, uh, you know, with the paper we validated in Karolinska and uh, Chang Memorial in Taiwan. But since then, we've had the chance to validate more with uh, our colleagues in Brazil and Barretos, in Maccabi in Israel, and in Levant and Kaiser as well. And so this just shows the performance of the model so far across all these different populations. On the left hand side, you see the numbers at MGH, so this is the 76 I showed you earlier. You see the actual American numbers in places where screening is done annually, ranges from 76 to 77, and is remarkably consistent across all these different subgroupings. And internationally, where the, the screening is more biannual, we actually see slightly higher numbers, ranging from 81 to 84. So this to us is really important, so it helps us give us the confidence that these models can actually be used. Now, there's still more investigation we're doing, more analysis about what's the, how, what's the right way to analyze these models, and we're very much excited to support partners pursuing things like for prospective trials. But these kinds of results showing that it actually works well and working hard to find new partners of different, of different patient populations is really important to make sure that the, the gains are really equitable and real. Uh, and these kind of results help motivate our partners at MGH to actually start using this model in the peak of the pandemic to help prioritize uh, who gets screened. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. And I want, like earlier, we made an announcement about welcome. And you know, one of the things that I mentioned there that you know, when Adam wanted to validate this model abroad, like in uh, Sweden, he had to fly to Sweden, he had to fly to Taipei to do the validation, and um, you, even you know, testing within the U.S. hospital, it's really challenging. And we really hope that for all the AI algorithms that MIT produces, and you've seen a lot of different MIT faculty, even alone at MIT, but obviously across the country, to create a platform which would enable testing and see what doctors are doing with these algorithms. You know, so you don't need to go to these huge feeds, and it becomes standard that you don't publish a paper. And we unfortunately seen a precedent of such publication in Nature at the beginning beginning of 2020, when uh, there was a published paper on you know, breast cancer detection, which again was only tested in one population. There is no information about race and all the key questions that we don't really understand if the models are applicable. So it's really important to create that benchmarking when you test across and you understand where it works and where it doesn't. But I wanted, uh, so this was not the question that I thought of uh, when preparing for the panel, but actually it's kind of a controversial question that came to my mind after listening to the first panel with a great interest. So a number of participants in the first panel were making very strong point that the, the you know, discrepancy in healthcare for certain population uh, you know, they are not a biological means. They really related to all this other, you know, access and healthcare um, inequity issues that, you know, our systems are really fraught with. So I totally agree that this plays humongous role here. Um, but I also felt that and, and of course, I'm not a clinician, and that's why I want uh, very much to hear from Dr. Gichoy, Dr. Aseni, if I'm really off the mark here, that biology does play a role. And I would give you an example where I think, you know, certain population greatly benefit from creating kind of targeted treatment pathways, like I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, and, you know, the fact that BRCA gene was discovered, that, you know, these women who were dying, where the families of women were dying, uh, you know, once it was discovered, there was a particular treatment plan, which, uh, you know, maybe not, it, it's a very harsh treatment, but it's a treatment and it saved lots and lots of women that prior to that pretty much would have a very, you know, challenging health outcomes. So in this case, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, the BRCA gene patients are only 10% of all the women for diagnosed with breast cancer. But my question is, how much of it do you think if we can identify in much more refined way with AI, different, um, you know, kind of signatures of subpopulations, maybe across, you know, racial boundaries, maybe not, and 
customize our screening and our treatments pathway. Do, do you think it, does it play a role? Because after listening to the first panel, I start really doubting myself, my previous understanding. Well, I will start by taking a stab at that. And I would say that um, the what the first panel I think made um, was trying to get across and uh, that we've sort of lost sight of to a certain extent is essentially when a lot of these papers um, list or categorize patients and they put the category Caucasian, um, Latina, Asian, um, African-American, you're, you're essentially making an assumption that you know, there are some genetic associations with that race that as of now, we have not yet shown, you know, race is a social construct, not a biologic construct as best as we understand it. So um, I would, when I think about, you know, tumor biology or when people say biology has a role in this, um, I don't think that, you know, that biology has no role in it. But I would say that if you're looking at all these factors that may affect outcome, why do researchers in particular focus on biology as you know, causing 90% or you know, 80% of the outcome that that's, that's a driver and you know, they leave like socioeconomic determinants of health to like 10 to 15% as the driver of outcome. And when realistically speaking, I think you could almost flip those things around. So that yes, in the ideal world and in breast cancer, to some extent, this is what we're doing. This is the goal of um, subtyping breast cancer, why we have things like oncotype, why we have things like mammoprint. You know, we are looking to subtype the cancer as best as we can so that we can target treatment. Um, but it doesn't matter if we target treatment if the patient cannot receive the treatment or if they're going to receive the treatment, it's going to occur like way past their, um, the optimal time for it, not in the preoperative setting, for instance, but in the adjuvant setting. These are all things that are driven a lot, a lot more by socioeconomic and socioeconomic determinants of health um, than it is by uh, than biology. And so what I would appreciate seeing is that nuance in papers, you know, that if you really do feel that there's a biologic basis to this, if there's a biologic construct, then dig deeper, you know, go, go in deeper. Um, I would say one of the papers I saw at the beginning of uh, the pandemic um, that, you know, it's a kind of paper that I read and I just roll my eyes and I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm just not incorporating this in any practice, is there were a group of researchers who um, decided to look at the concentration of a particular receptor in the nasal hairs of patients, saying that they believe that this increased uh, expression of this receptor in the nasal hairs of Black patients was responsible for the increase in mortality um, and infection from COVID-19. You know, to me, that's, you're really reaching. <laughs> you know, you are deliberately ignoring an obvious problem. I, I, you could be right. You could absolutely show that there's a difference in the density of this particular receptor in the nasal hairs of black patients versus Caucasian patients. But do you truly believe that that is what is driving the difference in outcomes, in mortality, in infection? That is where I think that, you know, as a clinician, I have a problem with some of the data that comes out. But Dr. Giyosha, I'd love to hear your view on this. Yeah, I think this is a really, really <laughs> complex uh, issue. And um, I think from the first talk, really one thing that we can think about, and, and uh, I like one of the faces from the first panel that said, you know, they also had the big data of their time when they were, you know, make, making these regions of uh, how to distribute uh, resources and, you know, delineate geographies. And, you know, and one thing that we always have to consider is what are we missing in the bigger picture, right? So we, we will get a very good model for breast cancer, right? But not everyone, again, can still get a mammogram. Even, you know, Adam has done a fantastic job, even just with a picture alone, you know? And, you know, so it means that if I could go to a Walmart or wherever I get and they could do a mammogram, 
I could have pretty much a little bit of an answer. And you can imagine innovative ways to think around um, implementing screening programs. And, um, but what I see is that, so there's personally, the, the, the biggest danger is about who's missing from the table when you're making these decisions. And that I think for us to forget those people who probably will not get a breast you know, mammogram till they palpate a lump and come for the screening exam, I mean, is a true disservice because probably the people will improve screening for and risk assessment already have their resources and would have probably been done uh, on time. And I think the bigger sense around breast cancer care is to improve, like, you know, reduce minimal, you know, advanced invasive interventions for cancers that have no consequence, you know, and then uh, provide um, more early, like risk profile for very aggressive cancers at an early stage. Now, in, when I was, uh, you know, in my medical student years, if you told me to concentrate on immunology, I really would not have given you a sense of how that would be important still probably last year, you know, and seeing through the vaccine and what immunotherapies are coming in. And so if you look at the pipeline of what's going in, and if you told me, you know, Judy, you have this lesion uh, or you don't have this lesion, but I think this is your breast cancer, then I won't be feeling so bad if I have to delay something for a little bit, maybe because of cost or uh, something, some other health issue. And what I wanna also still come back to uh, which is very, very difficult. Even the most educated black woman, when they are delivering, they have an equal risk of death. It doesn't matter their levels of education. People say things and they cannot be heard. They say, literally, I am dying and people will not respond to them. And so, uh, as I think we still have a long way in terms of changing the places where we provide healthcare for. And if this sort of more objective, rather consistent, uh, performances of these algorithms can help maybe remove a little bit of that barrier or lower the barrier so that the providers can have these discussions with black women maybe that's still a great step forward thank you long thank answer you. to say it's no no tough. this was a, a great idea now i want before we close in the panel ask you the following question i know that um um Colleen Stills was saying, where are we getting the grants for $1 million? But assuming, assuming that there are a lot of people from various foundations in the government, that you have, I don't know, $1 million funding and you would select a problem which you think is going to change an outcome. What is a research question or what capacity you think we can realistically deliver within you know, reasonable time uh, to change the outcome in the area of which combines AI and healthcare. What will be your bet? Um, infrastructure. It's not the sexy work, but Adam doesn't have to fly all over the world to get this done. And so if it takes him months and years for him to test his model, get feedback, move ahead, it's really, really difficult to prepare data and that work is not rewarded. It's not funded in grants. And, and when he comes back and says, look, there's a physics issue in this data set. I need to look at it. We still, it's still very, very difficult. And even I've talked to Stanford who released a lot of data. It takes them a lot of effort to do that. So a place to an infrastructure to work on at least improving data. And then two, to, uh, to support uh, model testing by not by medics because the, there's a big big barrier for inference. So there's I always say it's federated inference. There's a big big barrier for clinicians to participate in AI validation, and so it has to be seamless. And uh, that engagement and outreach has to be done. I think that's uh, because the engineers have a lot of outreach and advocacy, developer support, big companies working in this space. Uh, thank you. This is great. And uh, I have that welcome, at least welcome grant would allow us to do a lot of it, but I totally agree with you. And I just want to say for all the people from the federal agencies, at this time in this country, we don't have one mammogram data set and uh, we don't have a mammogram which represent the diverse population which are using mammograms today. Just one example. So uh, Dr. Seni, uh, what will be your bet? What would you think we need to do in the next few years? You know, I would say that it would be great if we could get a standardized and a national platform um, for other other markers of uh, race and ethnicity. 
essentially, you know, because I think that when, as you've pointed out in, in the MGH data set, I'm looking, well, I'm looking at a few things. There are some things they collect, there are some things they don't. And so because of that, the only thing I have to fall back on is race and ethnicity, um, which is self-reported, uh, you know, and, uh, and then I look at another data set and I try and compare it to that. And, you know, it's really hard to do. And so I, I think that, you know, we should be able to have a national standardized assessment, uh, you know, data set that allows us to get other assessments for race and ethnicity, sp specifically in regards to socioeconomic determinants of health. Um, there are some largest data sets out there that try and do this either with uh, zip codes or, you know, income. Um, but just think about what we've, you know, as the example with the vaccine, think about what we did in just one year in developing a vaccine essentially from, you know, the lab to, uh, you know, to patient, to the patient setting. I think that this is not as hard for us to do, but there has to be the funding and the willpower to do this because right now, I think we all agree that um, the standard that we're using of race and ethnicity, it's a very um, inelegant and inaccurate tool to assess these um, outcomes. Thank you. This is really, really a great, um, great suggestion. And especially, you know, like I'm always thinking that when we are saying like African American or Latino, there are many different types, correct? And we're just yeah. aggregating it from one variable and thinking about mixed marriages and stuff like this. It's really antiquated system uh, and obviously all the other factors that play such a big role are not part of it. And so Adam, you are closing um, the panel. So very brief, how would you spend a million dollars? And you cannot say that you're going to get many Samoans. So. Uh, I, I definitely agree with the notion of shared infrastructure. You know, it's, it's too hard to do this right right now. You know, we spent multiple years pursuing this broad validation, forming a lot of relationships, going through very long periods of contracting in order to do this kind of validation. And it's no easier for the next project and the next disease system going down the line. So if you want to think about systemically, if we want every single new AI health project to do this kind of validation and actually make sure it doesn't introduce new disparities, we need to make it systemically easy for people to do that and not put massive barriers of entry. I think part of that is having multiple hospitals come together and agree to help facilitate that. Part of that is new algorithms to help make this as a process more secure and help you know ensure privacy is part, part of the game. But uh, as a whole, removing barriers to access, I think is gonna make a huge difference for not just this technology, but all the future ones down the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. There are a lot of interesting suggestions here. And I hope in a few years from now, we are gonna see these statistics changing and definitely we're all at MIT and with our partners are committed to make it happen. So thank you very much, Dr. Sini, uh, Dr. Gachoya and, um, Adam, soon gonna be a doctor, <laughs> and we're moving <laughs> to the next panel. Thank you very much.